What's going on, crypto community? I'm Skylar Cobb, lead analyst and consultant at Crypto Consulting Group. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Adam Keller, a co-founder of CryptoProperties.io in Cincinnati, Ohio. In this interview, I talked to Adam about his background in real estate and blockchain. I talked to him about the current ICO landscape and how it was affecting his business. And we spoke about our mission that we both share to create a blockchain valley right here in the Midwest. With that being said, watch the video and enjoy. Finally, good to sit down with you. I've been excited about this project for a while, and I know we've been trying to link up, but I'm guessing you're a little bit busy as of recently. Yeah, a lot of travel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know a lot of our um, members, a lot of people that follow CCG have heard about your project. We've been tooting your horn there in Louisville. Nice. And so um, today, we really just want to give them you know, a good scope of what you're doing here with CProp, your background, your team, and what you're trying to do here in the uh, blockchain valley. Sure. Sure. So, um, why don't you start off with a little bit about yourself and kind of your background in real estate specifically? Yeah, so um, back in uh, 2009, uh, two co founders and I um, came up with uh, a company called Dot Loop. Yeah. Uh, at the time, it was called MLS Contracts, which was like not as good of a name. Uh, and we finally came, landed on Dot Loop after a lot of uh, thinking as to like what we were going to do with it. But essentially, the idea was we connect the dots and keep you in the loop. That's where the right. name kind of came from. Nice. Um, but uh, Austin Allison, who was, it was all his idea. Uh, I think he bought his first house when he was 18 or something like that. And uh, So a go-getter. Yeah, he's a go-getter. And then, uh, you know, through, you know, mutual acquaintances, uh, him, I, and a guy named Matt Forrest, who was our, our engineer on the project, uh, we all got together and spent the next 18 months either at a Panera Bread up in Clifton near UC's <laughs> campus working or at a, a Matt's a, a basement apartment up in a Blue Ash. Uh, but yeah, it was a lot of work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a designer and marketer by trade. Uh, do a little UX work as well. Uh, Matt was a, a developer. He built pretty much the whole thing in Java. And then uh, Austin is like the real estate brain behind everything. Just a well-rounded team all together. Yeah, yeah, it was a great team. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, people are what really make things successful. And the fact that, uh, you know, I, I give Matt and Austin most of the credit because, you know, they both went full time with it and, you know, endless hours at night just working on this thing to get it up and running. But uh, 2015, um, we, we built this thing to scale. We got it to a certain point. I think 80% of all the real estate agents in the country were using it. So um, Zillow came in and obviously, I mean, they owned the search. Right. Uh, we owned the purchase contract because what we did was we digitized all the purchase contracts so you wouldn't have to fax things anymore. And uh, they purchased us. It was a really nice uh, exit for me and uh, and for, for Matt. And then Austin stayed on as the director of Dot Loop, and he's still there to this day. And we got about 200 employees right now at uh, Longworth Hall uh, down near the river in Cincinnati here. And uh, yesterday, uh, we were just named by the mayor. It, uh, yesterday was Dot Loop Day officially uh, See, awesome. by the mayor. Yep, uh, we committed to, Zillow Group committed $25,000 to uh, the inner city. Um, and uh, we also committed to continue to um, uh, hire more people. Uh, for right. dot loop, so potentially doubling the staff in the next couple of years. Yeah, I know you talk a lot about um, how important it is for you to keep some of the talent and some of the value around here in Cincinnati. Um, I see that you have like a strong connection to this place. What does that stem from, and is that important for all of your businesses moving forward? Do you feel oh strong? for sure yeah yeah so I mean uh, you know as somebody who's uh, dot loop I believe was the first company the first startup. Uh, in Cincinnati to actually get money from the Valley. So only 1% of money, venture money, that's on the coast ever comes back into the middle of the country, which, you know, they refer to us as flyover, flyover country, country, which yeah. I take offense to. Because people, when you go to places like New York or LA or San Francisco, and you talk about Cincinnati, they may know someone from Cincinnati a little bit, but they think that this is an, it, it, Ohio and Kentucky is it, it just all farm. Right. That's what they think, right? They don't realize, you know, Ohio's the fifth biggest state population wise in the entire country. We've got three major cities here. And, you know, Cincinnati is, uh, I kind of really don't even consider us Ohio because we're on the border of Kentucky, we're on the border of Indiana, we're like more like DC. 
Yeah. It's almost like we should be our own little, like, our own little it's place. It's a separate entity, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got people from here that are fans of Ohio State, of UK, of Louisville, of all these different places, and it's it's a very diverse kind of place, I feel like. You're on the border of the North and the South, but it's a really cool place, and these 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 anyone who's on the coast, they just don't realize there's great ideas and a lot of corporate support here, and also in places like Louisville, right. um, where there's money there for ideas and corporate support to actually um, use those ideas in a real business. Uh, but for whatever reason, that money just stays on the coast. So yeah, it's almost like the talent is built in these local areas with small businesses, and then soon as soon as there's a chance for them to take that next step or that next level. Um, it's almost as if the interest dies down from where they are, and they have to go. They have to go out They're almost, because of the money. Yeah, exactly. Because you, there's only so much money here, and I think um, one of the biggest problems in, in venture right now is that early stage money's disappearing, especially mm-hmm. in places like Cincinnati. So people got burned when we started Dot Loop. Um, we were able to find wealthy individuals who could uh, just put money in, right. and they made their own decisions. Well, those guys on other projects got burned, obviously. And um, they stopped trusting their own instincts and started trusting the instincts of some of these early stage venture companies. Right. Well, then those early stage venture companies got burned, and now they only invest in Series A. So it's really difficult to raise any significant amount of money in Cincinnati in the angel stage. So a lot of people end up having to travel to the Valley, to Atlanta, to New York, to different places right. to try to go raise money. But you have to have money in order to hit the road show and go raise money. So it's barrier after barrier after barrier. Barrier after barrier after, barrier after barrier. And it's really hard, if you've got a great idea, to get that idea, to get traction, to gain customers, to get the market before your competition figures things out. Mm-hmm. So we lag behind just because, I would say, for the most part, lack of capital. I think there's plenty of talent here. Yeah, um, but exactly. because there's not enough capital, some of that talent leaves. There's talent and there's drive. I think people who are from this area, um, they may not want it, a little bit more than the people who are out there, but they understand what they have to go through uh, to get to that point. So they're they're willing to to fight for for those ideas that they have. But then they get to a point where, you know, if I want to continue what I have, I just have to go outside of it and um, or outside of the area that they're from. And that's yeah. that's something that CCG focuses on as well. Is you know we have interest outside of the state, we have interest outside of the nation, but we want to make sure that we build Louisville. Because that's where we're from, and we know that there is money. There's a lot of money for startups in Louisville. Um, you know, venture venture sharks and things that go on there. And we see that growth uh, occurring now, and big businesses moving in. But it's almost still as if we don't get that that credibility. We don't get that trust from people on the out, you know, the outside or on the coast. Like you said, if if there's a company that starts in Boston or Silicon Valley or New York, when people hear that, they automatically give credibility. Mm-hmm. Um, over yeah. something like a Cincinnati or a Louisville. Doesn't mean their developers are any better or the idea is any better. They just happen to live in one of those other cities. Exactly. And there is that preconceived notion. When I think for venture people, too, they realize, oh, these guys live in Boston, they live in New York, there's more money there. So if I invest my money in that, they could potentially get more financial support right. from their own communities than anything I invest in here. More stable. So, yeah, one thing we wanted to do was um, Luke Sestito, Sandy Selman, and I, we all got together. And we started investing in crypto back in early 2017. We all did really well. We were putting money into ICOs. Um, you know, things were rocking and rolling. Right. You know, since then, things have declined it was a bit. Good times. It was yeah, good times. but we were thinking, why are we investing in other people's ideas when we're good at building businesses and we've done things in the past? So, Luke Sestito and Sandy Selma, my other two co-founders, they both are in commercial real estate. So they do a lot of work with places like Jones Lang LaSalle. I'm on the residential side, obviously, with Dot Loop. Right. Um, so we were like, if we're going to do something in, in this blockchain world, uh, let's disrupt the real estate with a blockchain solution. So, uh, you know, we sat down and we thought through some things like, what are some of the areas that blockchain, uh, which is essentially trust uh, and immutability. It's a trust. It's trust in a ledger. It's- it totally is. It totally is. So how could we take that technology, this new form of database, and uh, apply it to uh, real estate transactions. Right. Uh, one thing that has never happened yet is nobody's actually digitized the close. Mm-hmm. You still go to a title agent's office. You still fill out a giant stack of a papers. Stack of papers. I remember, yeah, every single time. Every single time. That stack of papers then has to go to the county, right? The county sticks it in a filing cabinet. Maybe they have an electronic record somewhere. Maybe they don't. Maybe everything's paper-based. So... 
we did a little research. I think there's like 7,000 municipalities in the country. And if anybody knows how uh, blockchain technology works, uh, essentially each one of those counties could act as a node on a blockchain. Right. There could be one public record for all the, the titles, all the property deeds in the entire right. country. And each one of these could act as a node. Uh, CPROP down the road could potentially create the hardware, our own protocol that each one of those guys use. And you could use a proof of work blockchain system for these deeds, for right. these titles. And you would have redundancy in, in multiple cities, and you put it on that one ledger as opposed to, uh, you know, getting titles lost or fraud. I know fraud occurs often. Fraud is, is yeah. And, and you're just talking about the United States fraud. Yeah, exactly. You start going to other places, fraud is ridiculous. You give a guy, say, in Turkey, right? I don't want to pick on Turkey, but um, you have to give a lawyer, uh, an attorney, uh, the escrow. 50% of the time, this is what we hear, the guy runs off with your money. Why isn't that in a smart contract? Right. It could totally be in a smart contract. Why is there still that trust, that massive trust that you have to give somebody outside of your own realm, someone that you, you don't know? And if you want that piece of property, those are the channels you have to go through. And, and if you were American and you're trying to buy property in Turkey, you don't know a thing about their process. Right. So one of the things CPROP wants to focus on is trust, obviously, by using the blockchain. But the bigger idea is, is how do we enable cross-border transactions, right? How do we help people who, for example, are in China, which is the biggest money flow of real estate cross-border, goes from China to the United States. So there's a lot of Chinese buyers, mainly because, you know, they want to get, they want to invest in something outside of their Chinese borders. Right. So a lot of times they look at places like Manhattan, they look at places like South Beach, you know, markets that generally tend to go up and that they can also rent out um, right. when they're not there. So they're looking to purchase these properties in the United States. One thing CPROP wants to do is partner with property portals that these folks are already using. So, for example, they're in China. They're using a, a popular par property portal like a Zillow right. in China. They're looking for U.S. properties because a lot of these property portals have uh, agreements with each other where I can pull in your MLS data, you can pull in my MLS data. So they're looking at U.S. properties. They find one, they have to call the listing agent. The listing agent doesn't speak Mandarin, right? Right. So we have a button, essentially, that we put on each listing. It says, help me buy this property. They click on that. A list of agents comes up that they can filter through, find potentially a Mandarin-speaking agent that they can communicate with. Then they can go through the entire closing process on our platform. Right. So we have uh, actually you know, a Gantt chart or like a Microsoft project type of system that sits above all these digitized contracts. Mm -hmm. And you can see everyone in the process, what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it. So for the agent, it saves a lot of time on the phone. Right. You no longer have to answer these calls like, hey, where are we at in the process? Oh, the underwriter has it still. Oh, next day I'm calling them back. Hey, where are we at? Underwriter still has it, right? right. If the underwriter knew they were on a timeline, Maybe they'd move a little quicker, right? It would right? be faster. It would, it would be quicker to close. And then on the, the buyer or seller side as well, or the buyer rather, um, you know, they're, they're out of the loop most of the time as well. And that's one of the big pain points for a real estate agent is you have a new buyer. It's the biggest purchase of their entire life. They want yeah. to know what's going on at all times. Even if it's nothing, even if we're waiting for someone else to do their job, they want to know that. Exactly. And it was, uh, you know, frustrating as a real estate agent uh, to have to continue to hold their hand thinking, what, what other way can I do this? Because I have to speak to an appraiser. I have to speak to a, you know, a home inspector. I have, to, I have these different third parties that I already need to talk to, and I need to communicate that with my buyer. Um, and if I have multiple deals going on, then I'm always on the phone with people just updating them on what's going on. Exactly. Not lead generating, not you know, making, making it a smoother process. It's just, here's what's happening, and I need you to have this done by this time. With lead generation, too. Yeah. So Zillow's model, obviously, is you, as an agent, you buy a zip code. So you spend $10,000 a month advertising on Zillow, and now you get bumped up whenever someone comes on Zillow's platform and looks for a property, you show up, right? So there you are on this listing, um, and people generally contact that person, right? So, you know, you pay for that lead generation, right? So you you pay for that because Zillow is actually sending you deals. Right. We want to do the same thing. So every agent that's listed in our trusted database, um, everyone who's in there essentially buys our token. If no one knows how, how uh, crypto tokenomics work, um, essentially we have a fixed supply of tokens. 
And then some of those tokens go on an actual exchange and they're traded in the market. Right. Uh, and then some of those tokens go on our platform and they're actually used for something. And whenever you create the tokenomics of your platform, you have to figure out how does this token play in and how does this token um, gain demand over time? Like how do we get more people to use this token? Well, as our platform gets more popular, more agents want access to this international deal flow. Right. They purchase our token as a subscription for access to these foreign buyers. So it's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, as a U.S. agent now, how do you find Chinese buyers or Russian buyers or, you know, buyers in Malaysia? How do you find these people? Exactly. You have to be connected to somebody or someone. And it's usually, yep. it's usually centered in, into one, you know, channel. Exactly. It's not to all these other agents that could possibly um, help that Chinese buyer. Uh, it's, it's centered in one channel. And that's what I like about this platform as well is that it kind of gives not only everybody transparency, but everybody can be involved if, if they want to. Anyone can use that. Exactly. It's Relocations. Free, yeah. People, uh, say Procter & Gamble, for example, here in Cincinnati. Relocation is huge. They're bringing people from all over the world right. to Cincinnati to work here. So a lot of times they need to find agents or they need to find people to work with. Well, if I'm in, you know, uh, India and I come to work at P&G and I've got, you know, six months to find a house or whatever to live in, um, you know, I could work through P&G's relocation department or I could just use CPROP and find an agent and actually close on something myself and That's speak true. to someone who understands what I'm talking about. Exactly. You know, speaks Malayalam. Or whatever, right? Yeah. So, uh, so that's that's the that's the power of, of what we want to do. Essentially, break down borders and connect people. So, is there a way for agents to move themselves up based on um, their membership style, or I guess well, how much the way they, they move up in our system is ratings. So it's very much like an Angie's List or Home Advisor or something like that. So, as people close on our platform, the buyer and seller can actually rate the agents, they can rate whoever's involved in the process, right. the bank, all third parties, all third parties um, would get ratings. We actually give some of the tokens to the buyers and sellers in exchange for their time to actually rate these That's folks. That's an incentive. So exactly. it's a self-driving economy, really. It is a self-driving economy. So think of it as like Sky Miles, right? I mean, right. you go out to dinner, uh, if you have your Sky Miles, your card connected to your Sky Miles account, you'll get points. And then you use those points to purchase things like gift cards. So if you're the buyer or the seller, you want these tokens because we plan on working with third-party providers like, say, a Lowe's or a Home Depot or a carpet cleaner, and they could then use these tokens as a discount and, and get a discount on whatever these services are from these third-party uh, providers. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's brilliant. Yeah, and then those tokens get used up, and we actually have a, a token burn mechanism. So any tokens that are used in our platform – um, to, to, to help out um, uh, the people who, who believed in our project early on, um, what we want to do is anyone who holds the token, 80% um, uh, of all the tokens that are used in the platform from day one are burned, So, which means we get rid of those out of the total out of the supply, ecosystem. out of the ecosystem, up to 20% of the total supply of tokens. So from day one, 80% of every token that's used is getting burned. Once we reach that 20% mark, we stop. But now, 20% of those tokens are out of the platform. And as more agents come onto our system, they're going to need to buy tokens. Right. So at some point, potentially, we may even have to go to an exchange that we have our tokens listed on, pull some of those off of the exchange to uh, into your system. pull back into the system and be used by, uh, by agents. See, I, this project... Um I mean, to me personally, it, it almost checks off everything on the list that I look for when I look into ICOs. I don't, I don't look at ICOs very much just because of, um, you know, in 2017, you know, how kind of bad I, it got with, with scammy projects. So I usually oh. wait a little bit longer just so I can do my due diligence, just so I can look um, into the project a little more, do more research. But with this project, with CPROP, you have the team behind you of people who know what they're doing. Yeah, they've done it before, and they're committed to this project as well. You have problems that need a solution. Uh, workflow in real estate is more than needed. There's um, over 100 things that a real estate agent has to do. And the last thing they want to have to do is be on the phone call without getting paid, right? Yeah, So this, they, they hate it. Yeah, this relieves um, some of that time, that opportunity cost for them, so they can lead generate more. That's right. Then you have the solution for the buyer 
who um, I know you're focusing on cross-border, so they're looking for uh, investments in other countries, but there's different processes, different ledgers, and different uh, you know uh, languages in each country, right? So this kind of brings it all together and creates that one-stop shop, if you will, for those buyers to have trust in a system and to be able to properly buy. Exactly. Right? And then the tokenomics makes sense. So that's kind of my last check off the box is, does this project need a native asset? Does it need a token for it? And um, I mean, this, this works perfectly. It's a membership model. To have a free system for people to use, it, there has to be payment from, from some direction. Someone has to bring money into the system, and that comes from your third-party vendors who want to be on, you know, on your platform. Exactly. So it, it, it checks off each stage, and I don't want to come off as so bullish, you know, that you know, anybody <laughs> who's watching this thinks, well, he's shilling. Well, it's hard to be bullish when the overall market is bearish right now. <laughs> right, right. But this is a time where you do that due diligence. Yeah. This is a time where, where you look at these projects who are building. You look at some projects that may be built, but they're continuing the roadmap. And you say, um, are they going to be around in a few years? Mm -hmm. And this is one of those that I see just from having experience in uh, real estate, which is the largest asset class, um, you know, in, in the world, arguably, over right. $200 trillion. And how illiquid it is um, to be able to do that transaction because of lack of transparency um, and trust. Yeah, and I think, to your point... I think with this bear market, a lot of the scam projects have been filtered out. Right. I think there's a lot of ICOs out there that were very scammy, looked really good, um, but the team seemed kind of like vague. Right. That you couldn't really do research on some of the team members. And I think because you know you hear all this talk about regulation from the government, from the U.S. government, from other uh, the Chinese government, and all these other places, I think what they need to do is if they wanted to regulate this market, they should actually regulate the team members. Because the team members need to be tracked. We need to know who they are um, so that they don't potentially run off exactly. with the money. There needs to be some kind of a system in place. Um, you know, For us, for example, if you go on some of these uh, uh, ICO ranking sites, we've checked off on everything. Uh, you can see exactly who we are. You can connect to our LinkedIn page. Our information's there. Uh, and it helps boost up your ICO ranking. And I think in some cases, there are some paid ones, but there are ones that are legitimate and can help filter out some of that stuff. Right. Um, but I think some of the scammy things are gone, not just because of regulation and the fear of regulation. I think the market itself is self-regulating. I, I agree. I mean, you've got things like uh, 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 caps. So we have a $20 million cap, uh, and that keeps you from raising too much money because uh, people who trust in your product early on, they, they don't want uh, everyone buying the token uh, at the pre-sale or in the private sale, right. they actually want people to, to buy them on the exchange, right? Exactly. And you want them to buy it on the exchange. So, um, you know, having a cap is good, right? The market dictated that, yeah. right? The market, and, and, and there's other things out there too, like uh, uh, we have to hold our tokens for two years two as years, the so. founders to ensure that the project is actually going to, to get going. And that's good. That's a good thing. Right. I think more people need to do that. The market dictated that. Right, and if people... Um, if people were to set those expectations, if there was the entire market that said, no, I'm, you can't just sell your tokens right when it goes live, or you can't just be an anonymous figure behind you know, a little cartoon and say you're one of the founders. Ryan Gosling's photo yeah, with exactly. the Chinese guy's name. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Which is interesting. Like, exactly. But those were out there, right? Like right. Those projects were out there. Uh, there's a guy in Vietnam ran off with like $300 million in, 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 uh, in money. Yeah, well, I, shut I the saw website down. It's crazy. Um, an article yesterday said the FTC, um, I guess, it came out with a number. It was around $3 billion for what they expect people to be scammed in this market. And you can think of it as, well, do your own due diligence and don't invest in something you don't understand and run away. And while that's true and that's my belief, I think the market should dictate that. And people who get into something they don't understand or don't uh, research fully are just gambling. And sometimes when you gamble, you lose. I also think that the average person needs a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a complicated space. People are completely changing the way they think about money, completely think, uh, changing the way they think about trust and third parties and how do I send value and what is value at yep. the end of the day. Um, and with that is going to come a little bit of a learning curve. And in that learning curve, you're going to have people being scammed. 
Um, I also think one, one more interesting point is with this bear market, with companies that raise money through Ethereum or Bitcoin, for the ones that aren't successful or the ones that don't have uh, a real product that has value, because that Ethereum and Bitcoin dry prices drop so much and they have to pay developers, I think that's becoming a problem for them to continue. If they didn't have an idea that is, is worthy of a blockchain or is even necessary at the end of the day, and people simply speculated and invested um, off speculation and not off substance, I think we're weeding them out just through yeah. this bear market as well. You are. So you are. It, it, it sucks for the time being, but after this bear market and this accumulation stage, I think really the projects that are going to be strong and stand afterwards are the one that had value, um, you know, the ones that had value in the first. And place. we need those projects. I mean, I one thing I want the crypto blockchain uh, industry to do well. I mean, all of us do, right. and uh, we're big fans of it. Obviously, we invested, we made money, we did really well. Um, but I buy into um, me owning my money. Right, like really own owning bank. my money, being my own bank. I love the idea of of blockchain based money. I like the idea of Bitcoin. I really believe in that concept, um, but not just the, the 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 coin part of it. Right. Um, you know the technology behind it. That is the value. Exactly, being essentially Internet 3.0. Mm -hmm. Like this is could be the foundation. This database structure could be the foundation of decentralized projects on this new internet that right. we're building right now. This is the future. This is the next thing. And we're maybe in like 1996 of the, of the dot com boom, Just the right? Beginning, yeah. Just the beginning stage. And, and, you know, there's bugs, there's scalability issues, there's stuff like that. But you need companies like ours that are going to come out, aren't going to be completely decentralized, right? Everybody gets on Ripple because they're not completely decentralized, Right. right. But they're in the crypto space. They're actually doing stuff. They actually have real relationships that they've built. So, you know, there's always this divide, I feel like, in the crypto community between the old school, 100% decentralized, libertarian kind of blockchain, almost anarchic blockchain people right. versus the folks that are like, hey, we believe in capitalism and let's actually build a business. So for CProp, yes, we have components that fall into the process where they make sense that are blockchain and decentralized. Right. But for the most part, we're building a platform that is still very centralized. Well, every, everything doesn't need to be cent uh, decentralized. And that goes back to my point of not every project that comes out that I look at, uh, most of them actually, they don't need a blockchain. Mm -hmm. You need a database. You need a ledger, right? You don't need a blockchain. Yep. Um, you know, putting putting titles on, on a blockchain just makes sense. It's, yep. it's immutable. It, it's something that people can view. Um, and there are people who are actually working on that now. There are people who are working on creating a ledger um, for titles. Right. Uh, and, and we don't necessarily have to do that. I just want to be the marketplace, essentially, where these deals get done. Exactly. I want to be the place that this stuff happens. And if you know, there's a, there's a third-party contract system out there, like an Agrello, right. that we can use, let's use that. If there's a KYC software out there that we don't have to build that we know is trusted and works, let's do that. Yeah, don't and we can, the wheel. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. We can patch these other technologies together and create our platform out of that, uh, which is one strategy. Or, um, depending on if we hit our hard cap or not, or if we raise enough money, we can bring in a team and actually build all that stuff from scratch, and we own that. So it's a decision we have to make, but there's technologies out there and partners out there that we can bring along with us. So if there's a blockchain forms company out there, if there's a blockchain KYC company out there, uh, if there's a company out there that's digitizing and, and putting all these titles on, on a blockchain on one public record, we'll work with them. Exactly. Because then the whole industry can come up together. And exactly. that's one of our main things is let's bring some credibility to this industry. Let's, let's have a company that's not a scam that actually has a real business model and, and a path solution. to revenue and real solutions and actually going to solve problems and not just force the square blockchain peg into the round business hole. Right. Like, let's actually do it where it makes sense. Right, right. So one more thing I wanted to go over is, um, you know, when a lot of people look at this project, um, I've just seen that they get excited about it, they're ready to move, they're ready to get into it, and then they hit this barrier of not being allowed to invest in it because of, um, you know, SEC regulation and, and things that go with that. So... I know that that's a 
been a barrier for multiple ICOs, but for you, it almost seems like you all have been blessed in the Asian markets mm -hmm. um, yeah. to have either connections out there or really just interest out there um, for this product. And uh, if you want to just talk about sure. that, how it's a little yeah. bit different. You know, people may understand the problems or the uh, the cumbersome process of a real estate transaction here, but it's almost as if out you know in out there rather they. Uh, they really believe in it and, and really want to be involved. They do. There's something about, um, I'd say, maybe the Korean culture where um, they're, they're open to risk, right. right? They're open to risk, and they believe in technology. And they want to see this do well, just like we want to see this do well. And they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. Right. Just like all of us, we're willing to put our time and our money into this project to make this happen. Um, so... Uh, one of our uh, advisors is actually lives in Busan, South Korea, and he's working essentially to set up meetups. So one of the biggest successes we found, there's, let me just say this, you could spend a lot of money in this industry. There's a lot of folks out there that claim they could bring investors to the table or uh, supporters to the table. They're like, hey, we can help you find advisors. We can help you do this. We can help you do that. Right. Everything is crazy expensive in this market. There's attorney fees or $25,000 a month potentially. Everyone wants their cut. Of Everybody money. wants their cut. They see money and they want to get in here and they want, it, they want their cut of it. So what we've done is, is we felt the pain of hiring good people, hiring bad people, um, what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, we talked to the, you know, obviously we've talked to regulators, uh, which I believe there should be definitely regulation in this market. Right. I think they should use a light touch, but I think uh, Adam Smith, free markets, I think, you know, let the market dictate mm -hmm. kind of what happens. Like I spoke to earlier, it's actually starting to do that. Um, but uh, the U.S., you, you just can't take U.S. money. You can't touch the U.S. You can't advertise in the U.S. You can't make claims that you're going to buy this token and it's going to go through the roof. That's not going to happen. Like you can't say that, right? You can talk about the business. This is going to be a very successful business. Here's how the tokenomics work and come to your own conclusion, right? right. Um, but you can't make these claims and, uh, you know, I don't think we need to make claims. I'd rather, I'd rather show them that this you is going to work. substance that you don't have to, uh, to add the bells and whistles no. on something. You got to be really careful though. You right. white paper, your light paper, your executive summary, no claims in the whole thing. So you have to be very careful when you do your language. So if there's any ICOs out there that are looking to do this, um, there's, there's some things you got to know. And, uh, once we, once we get through this process, we'll know what works and what doesn't work. Right. It's probably going to cost us 300 to $500,000 to get through this whole entire process. I'd like to, to cut that into a third. And I think we can just based on the stuff that we've done that didn't work going to ICO pitches. It could be 5,000 to 10,000 to 15,000 dollars just to pitch An idea. for 15 minutes with 30 other companies, that's a lot of money. Plus on top of that travel and everything else, yeah. what we've discovered is it actually makes more sense just to sponsor the after party and then actually meet with people, right? right. Uh, do a meetup in a place like South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, 200 people at our last meetup showed up and we got folks that were interested in, in purchasing the token early on. Uh, you know, you meet p developers, you meet people who can actually help you with your project. Folks that have done stuff, folks that understand the, the Korean real estate market uh, and the Asian uh, market overall. Right. Uh, so this whole ICO thing, it's an opportunity for people to do international business. I mean, this is an international business that we're building. Right. Uh, and it requires a lot of travel. It requires a lot of time. Not everybody is – it's not going to work for every single idea. But um, the ideas it does work for, you go from raising money in your local community. And, and being kind of gated out of all these other places because you guys got tons of uh, ideas down in Louisville that the Louisville money needs to go into. Exactly. We've got ideas here that the Cincinnati money needs to go into. So for me to go to Louisville and try to get money, it's going to be very difficult. For me to go to Boston and try to get money, it's going to be very difficult. But now you're talking about raising money all over the world. Say $20 million and bringing that money back into your region and hiring talented developers, keeping them in town. And now I've got runway to actually build a project, get it to market quickly and, and have the potential to have a, a, you know, a unicorn startup here in Cincinnati. Now multiply that by five. Exactly. Now I've got five $20 million startups, hundred million dollars that I raised from regions 
that that money would have never come here any other way. Right. And it comes from solutions like this that work in um, every market. You know what I mean? It's it's real estate. It's global. And there are people feeling this pain all over the world when it comes to the yep. cumbersome process. That's a key point. So if you plan on doing an ICO, it needs to be something that international people find attractive. For instance, real estate, like to your point. Yeah. Um, it has to be an, something that has the opportunity to be an international business. It can't be a local, you know, whatever it is to solve some local issue, delivery service or whatever. This has to be something that People can use all over the world, and it draw, it reduces borders, and it connects people. And it makes sense. And it makes sense. Yeah, and it makes sense. So who are right now your biggest competitors? Uh, I've looked at other real estate, blockchain, uh, you know, Atlant and Proppy and things like that, and they don't seem to, uh, I guess, directly compete. Maybe if you group them together in the crypto market and you're trading whatever, they might put that in the same sector. But for right now, um, who are your biggest competitors, and what are the solutions that you provide that they just can't seem? So obviously, uh, existing platforms, you know, existing centralized platforms would I'd say be uh, be a competitor in some way. But we're actually trying to partner with some of those people. We're not completely disrupting the entire industry. We don't want to do that. We want to integrate into the already existing process that's right. there. A lot of what we would consider our competition is trying to completely disrupt the industry. Or what they're trying to do is tokenize assets. So they're trying to take a real estate, like say a, a multifamily building, break that up into 100,000 little pieces, and then sell those tokens off. Um, and people say, well, why wouldn't you just do that with like a, an ownership statement? Like, why can't I just like do that on paper? Why do I need to tokenize that? Well, because there's a third market, a third party or a third market for these tokens. Right. I can take these tokens at any time. And sell those on an exchange. It's liquid. It it's liquid. It's much more liquid. To it at the extremely liquid market. Exactly. So most of our competitors are actually doing that portion of it. That's not something we want to do. We want to really just focus on connecting these buyers and sellers, uh, and connecting agents to these potential buyers, and dropping borders, and then closing the deals on our platform. So not many people are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't looked up. That's. Why I asked the question? I haven't. Yeah, I haven't seen other competitors. That was another box I tried to check. Is you know, out of those competitors, where where are you kind of fitting in? And it's so too ambitious. Like some of the things that they're doing are just way too ambitious. It's like, you know, that's great. You want to do that. And people, when they first hear these ideas, are like, oh wow, that would be huge if you could do that. Right. But you got to take baby steps. And one thing I've learned from doing startups in the past is, you don't try to anger the industry, right? right? If you want to do something big and you want to think big, that's great. Down the road. Let's build a brand first. Let's Basically. get some customers. Let's get some folks behind us. Let's build some traction. Market as well. If you go through the, the existing channels and you make them better and you make it uh, make sense for all of the parties involved, um, if it's just a better solution than the way that they've gone through, there's naturally that's right. value that's added to that. There's naturally a demand that comes to that. Exactly. Um, and that's why I'm really excited about this project. And I thank you very much for uh, giving us this interview today. Sure. It's been yeah. really enjoyable, and I'm excited to see where this goes. I, fortunately, obviously, I'm in America, so I can't get in. <laughs> but uh, I will definitely be following this. And, uh, you know, everybody that's at CCG, I'm sure you've heard of me post this, talk about our investor meetups. This is definitely one to keep track of. This guy knows what he's doing, and he has a lot of people around him that knows what they're doing as well. So thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate it. Good talking to you. Thanks. Ooh, nice.